Hi everyone, this is Jason, producer of Data and Biotech. Before we get started, I wanted to let you know about our latest white paper. It's a comprehensive guide to implementing machine learning models in biotech manufacturing. It's a complete overview of all the potential problems of ML adoption, and more importantly, how to solve them. To download it, simply visit connect.cordine.com forward slash biotech dash ML. We've also dropped the link in the show notes of this episode. Okay, let's get into it. Welcome to Data in Biotech, a podcast from Cordine where we explore how companies leverage data to drive innovation in life sciences. Every two weeks, we sit down with an expert from the world of biotechnology to understand how they're using data science to solve technical challenges, streamline operations, and further innovation in their business. This week, we sat down with Harshal Patel, Head of Scientific Development at Sakara Labs. Harshal shared his journey from working at Cancer Research UK and the Francis Crick Institute to joining Sakara, the company that brought Nextflow to market a workflow management tool designed to simplify the complex process of analyzing large sets of biological data. During the interview with Ross, they both discussed the importance of collaborative open source projects in advancing scientific research and why it's essential that as an industry, we create standardized reproducible workflows. Here we go. Harshal Patel, welcome to the Data and Biotech podcast. Thank you, Ross. So just to kick us off, would you mind giving us an introduction to your background and what brought you here today? Yeah, sure. I'm Harshal Patel, Director of Scientific Development at Secura. So I've got a bioinformatics background. I initially started working at Cancer Research UK and the Francis Crick Institute in England, in London. And I worked in a core facility there for, for over 10 years doing mostly genomics type of analysis. And I've essentially done the tricks of the trade and working with some awesome scientists, Nobel Prize winners at the Crick. And then I learned Nextflow very early on in its evolution. This is when it was still being developed out of the CRG in in Barcelona. And so I became part of the furniture with the community really, and I've never left, to be honest. And then also started integrating myself with NF Core, which is this community that sits alongside Nextflow, where they have best practice pipelines and has become really popular for running pipelines, whether that's off the shelf or contributing and coming into the community. And so the natural transition for me after the Crick was really to carry on working with Nextflow. I love Nextflow, it changed my life. And to then um, join Sakira, who, which is essentially the home of Nextflow. And so I, I, I've known Paolo and Evan for, for quite a long time now. And pretty much as soon as they got Series A funding, they, they said to me, look, do you want to come on board as our only biopetition? And I couldn't refuse essentially. And so that was my next step as a career in the, my career, uh, which was almost now two and a half years ago. Um, I joined as employee number 13 in the company. We're now almost over 80 in that space of time. I've also now started building my own team out. And so yeah, it's been phenomenal being part of, of the growth of the company as well as Nextflow and all of the other cool things that we're doing in the open source. So my role at Secura now is very much customer focused. We tend to be the content experts for Nextflow and Fcore, as well as the platform. And so we help our customers with their adoption of the platform and various other components that we've got, which I'm sure we're going to drill into a bit later on. But I'm also I'm also still heavily contributing back to open open source and, and our team is is very much committed to that because that's essentially where Nextflow came from. Yeah, that's awesome. Could you just uh, give me an introduction to what Nextflow is and like what Sakara is as a part of that? Absolutely. So Nextflow was initially written and, and developed to solve problems with scalability at the CRG, essentially. And the CRG is one of the most awesome institutes that you'll ever see for research. It's located at, on a beach in Barcelona. It's the envy of the world that way. And Nextflow was written as, as essentially a workflow management tool. And the idea there is that when you do any type of analysis, really, it's a series of steps. You take some sort of input data and then you process it. That produces some sort of output file and, and bioinformatics, as we know, is very file heavy. A lot of data gets flows through bioinformatics. And then the output of that file task goes to another task as input. And then you end up having this graph of a pipeline, essentially, where data is essentially flowing through the pipeline in order for you to then end up with something that you can interpret as a result, whether that's gene expression results or some sort of single cell analysis plot or something that you can go and look at in, in a browser. And so Nextflow was developed essentially to try and help tackle some of these problems, but to bring modern software engineering practices into the mix, which wasn't really well known in biology at the time. Typically before then, I used to write custom 
scripts to do my analysis, which no one else could ever run. And Nextflow was essentially written to, to solve some of these problems. And so it started off 10 years ago through the community. It's open source. It will always remain open source. And over time, it gained more and more traction in the life sciences, mostly where others wanted to start using it for their own purposes. And then five years into that, Secura was formed initially to offer training as a company. So Evan and Paolo formed Secura to initially offer training and essentially go on pilgrimages around the world to, to train, to train others in Nextflow uh, at the time. And then we had a very simple sort of application at the time, which was previously known as Nextflow Tower that allowed you to run and monitor Nextflow pipelines via user interface. So rather than typically running via a command line, like you would do with Nextflow, this gave you the ability to start now monitoring things via user interface and Secura and the platform that we have now has essentially evolved through that. And we've got a ton of other features and various other things there. So I guess the main aim of Secura to summarize is to make scientific data analysis accessible at any scale. Can you talk a little bit about why people choose to use Nextflow in the first place? You mentioned writing a bunch of custom scripts versus leveraging leveraging the open source packages that are available in NF Core. I'm imagining that it just it saves them a lot of time and a lot of effort in terms of writing custom code, but there's also a reproducibility element. So what are some of the considerations that lead people to the Nextflow ecosystem in the first place? So Nextflow has a, has a num number of, of key let's say buzzwords that make it very appealing for scientists and anyone in general, really. So that, that includes portability, for example. So you can write a Nextflow pipeline that runs on your laptop and then quite easily then run exactly the same pipeline on a complex infrastructure like cloud or HPC. Um, Nextflow supports out of the box, I think up to 18 different executors already, common executors where you can run exactly the same pipeline in different situations. Scalabilities, Nextflow inherently takes care of things like task parallelism. So when you typically run a pipeline on a scheduler or something like that, and you've got 10 samples, running it on a thousand samples is a completely different problem. That's a different scale, right? And you don't necessarily want to get into the weeds of orchestrating the execution of all of those tasks. Each pipeline could be 20 or 30 different processes and each task is a thousand. So you, you start doing the maths and slowly you start seeing that it's quite a complex problem actually trying to push data through a pipeline. Mm -hmm. And so Nextflow ma manages that inherently out of the box without you needing to get any custom stuff together for that. One of the key things for me, I think is reproducibility. Science is built on the concept of reproducibility. If we can't do an experiment three times and reproduce what we've done, then there's a problem, right? In a similar vein, when you want to analyze the data that's coming out of those, those experiments, we need to be able to reproduce that result over and over again. And there are some things that Nexo has, has adopted over the, over time, like containerization that again, weren't very well known in life sciences, but were used more in modern software development at the time that have now been integrated into life sciences. The scientists now know what a container is. You go back five or 10 years, no one knew what a container was or what it meant. It was just some abstract concept. Someone might have come, well, what's a container? Like I put my takeaway in it, but, but actually it's not, it's something that's, that's an isolated environment where you can reproduce exactly the same result from, from a pipeline execution. And so those are some of the, the key benefits that you get from using something like Nextflow. And given its adoption across life sciences in general, it's become more and more widely used. And also part of this is the shift to cloud computing as well. A lot of organizations are moving to the cloud to, to process their data. And I can bet your bottom, bottom dollar that there are a number of organizations that have started off with bash scripts, Python scripts, or legacy systems that uh, no one's maintaining anymore. And now they need to look for the next solution in order to run their pipelines on the cloud. Nextflow has matured to some extent to run uh, workflows on the cloud. Again, this was forward thinking on Paolo's part with Nextflow as well, is adding cloud support and really working with, with AWS and, and Azure and GCP and, and other cloud providers to improve the support for cloud execution, which has now made it easier for, for those in 
big pharma and, and biotech to transition to the cloud and also start using off the shelf content like NF Core because it works out the box. That makes a lot of sense. What are some of the biological analyses or processes, pipelines and use cases that are available or typically used inside of NF Core that people can just off the shelf pull down and start working with? So NF Core now has over 100 pipelines, which is phenomenal. The, one of the big advantages of the community itself is that you can bring your domain expertise to NF Core. We typically only allow, allow one data type per pipeline. So there's only one RNA seq pipeline. There's only one chip seq pipeline. If you allow multiple, then slowly you'll get out of hand. It becomes confusing as to what you need to contribute to and how. And so there are some fundamental guidelines on NF Core, the, the, like the testaments essentially of NF Core that have been around for, for quite a while now. And they've helped to define what the community looks like and, and how we can impose certain restrictions and rules in terms of pipelines. So now, yeah, we've got over a hundred pipelines. The, the most popular is probably the RNA seq pipeline. It's one that I still maintain, manage, and it tends to be the gold standard pipeline for NF Core as in terms of RNA seq processing, but also in terms of what we're doing with Nextflow. The community itself isn't just about doing analysis for a particular data type. It's also how we can push Nextflow. How can we evolve Nextflow to make it even better uh, and solve some of the, the problems that we're not necessarily solving properly by implementing a pipeline in a typical way. And so ideally, whatever we're doing on NF Core then gets filtered back as feedback to Nextflow and Paolo, who I can just DM and say, Paolo, we need this. Can, can you help us out? And he just, he finds a solution with others like Ben on the team who are doing a phenomenal job with the Nextflow code base. So RNA seq tends to be the most popular, but there's all sorts of pipelines now. Genomics is one of the most common applications. And that's just, again, because there's just tons of genomics data knocking about. But on NF Core, we have genomics pipelines, proteomics pipelines, metabolomics pipelines, image analysis pipelines, protein folding pipelines, astronomy pipelines, earth sciences pipelines. I think this just shows the versatility of Nextflow. Any pipeline you can containerize. So any piece of software you can put in a container to run a pipeline, you can have a Nextflow pipeline with that. It doesn't have to be restricted to genomics. And we're seeing more and more uptake of these sorts of things in, uh, in the community, especially. Yeah, I'm really interested in the decision to constrain the pipelines in NF Core to one per analysis type. And it makes sense in the, sci in the context of scientific analysis that there's just this explosion of people working on different, on different pipelines and competing ideas about how pipelines should be structured. And so forcing the open source community to work together and figure out the best version of that pipeline that incorporates all of those competing paradigms makes a lot of sense. But could you just walk us through that decision and how Nextflow's open source model has shaped its development. Absolutely. Over time. So Nextflow offers benefits in terms of collaboration as well, which we haven't really touched on, right? So Nextflow, the way that you write Nextflow and the way you make it available to others is by some sort of Git repository, whether that's GitHub, Bitbucket, GitLab. And so when you write your pipeline, you tend to commit and push it to a Git repository. NF Core itself is all GitHub based. And so we've got a hundred pipelines, as I said, all of them are on GitHub. They're all open source. All of our collaboration happens via GitHub. Again, this is something that wasn't necessarily around 10 years ago before Nextflow, which has essentially enforced that scientists and developers, in order to write their pipelines, actually collaborate on writing code. And everything is version control down to the individual commit as to when you add a piece of documentation and you commit it on GitHub, you know exactly who's pushed that commit. It's not just a, a find save on a local computer and you have no idea as to how that was done. And so there's also version control that needs to happen and reproducibility, reproducibility is also important when you're writing your pipeline, not only with the containers, because when you write a pipeline, you release a particular version that becomes a static version of that pipeline that you can run now or in 10 years time. And it should give you the same result if you're using the same containers and, and the same input data. And so the open source model that Nextflow offered to collaborate via GitHub and, and Git providers was essentially the decision to then also form the NF Core community around GitHub and to allow people to communicate, collaborate on these pipelines via GitHub. So writing a pipeline is one thing, but also another thing that's really important is reviewing code. You can write a pipeline. Another guideline in NF Core is the fact that when before you release a pipeline, you need to have it reviewed depending on what your pull requests would look like and, and where it's going. 
you need to have it reviewed by other community members to, to ensure that you haven't missed anything. People miss things all the time, including me. And it's good having oversight on it. And so this is another sort of best practice type of guideline that we've got. But ultimately, I think in terms of one data type per pipeline, and trust me, we've had pushback on this because there have been others that have said, no, we don't want to do this. We want another step in this pipeline that you currently don't have. And the way that we address those problems is, look, this is a community decision. No one really owns this pipeline. It's owned by NF Core. It's a community pipeline. We will make this decision jointly and we'll be sensible about the decisions. We'll try and follow literature and what's best practice in the literature and add it as an option. Because at some point for rna processing, you don't necessarily want to add a hundred tools just because hundred tools exist. It doesn't make sense. They might not be the best tools, in which case you want to narrow that down to what is actually useful, right? And then it, it also, in terms of contributions, it makes it a lot clearer to community members to say, okay, we're contributing to one rna pipeline here. We're not contributing to 15. Yeah, and, and that's where it, it avoids that conflict. Also, people that want to run a pipeline, all of these efforts are going to improve a single pipeline rather than improving a ton of other pipelines that, that don't make sense. So there's always one sort of brain pipeline that just gets better and better over time. Is there a, a hierarchy of community managers, like a person who oversees each pipeline and then a group of people who are nominated to be reviewers of the pipelines and assess whether this is worthy of incorporation, recommend that the pull request get merged into the pipeline? Yep, yep, absolutely. So typically, we will have community members come in and suggest that they want to add a proteomics pipeline. Then I, for example, don't have any proteomics background, but other people in, come into the community because they like NextFlow and they want to contribute a pipeline to the wider community to use, which makes a lot of sense. And, and they're also happy to follow the guidelines, which is also quite important. Um, and they'll come to us and say, look, we have a pipeline. Sometimes they may already be tag teaming with others internally within their team or in the community to get this pipeline off the ground. And they'll start working on it, get a plan of action. We have a request review channel in NF Core where members of the community can come in and request reviews on their pipelines from others in the community. And then we, we, we have uh, again, a tag teaming type of approach there where members will swap reviews with others if need be to actually get their pipeline through and that sort of stuff. So it, it's fairly dynamic. Some pipelines have set members that are contributing to it and a, a lead developer, essentially. Others are more organic where you've got 15 or 16 active developers contributing to that pipeline. Like, and of course, Sarek, which is a very calling pipeline. It's a huge pipeline. And over time, Loads of people have started contributing to this routinely and have formed their own essentially team to improve the pipeline. That makes a lot of sense. So what are some of the biggest challenges that people face when onboarding to NextFlow for the first time, like individually or as an organization? NextFlow at times can be like Marmite. You either love it or you hate it. This sometimes, this is the draw to Snake Nick for people in that it's written in Python. It's got that, the familiarity that a lot of people have with a conventional programming language. Having said that, there are other benefits that Nextflow offers that make it a really good entry point for people to come in. I mean, you don't necessarily need to know any Java or Groovy. There's this common misconception that because Nextflow is written in Groovy, you need to know Groovy. Having worked with Groovy, I, I can say it's exactly that. It's amazing to write Groovy code. It, it solves problems. In I mean, I came from a Python background, but having learned and written Groovy to do some of the more mundane things that you wouldn't necessarily, aren't necessarily exposed by the NextFlow DSL. And so just for background, actually, Snake makes written on Python. It's a bit like a, a make type of solution, whereas NextFlow is written on Groovy. Groovy is actually a very powerful language to write what are called DSLs or uh, domain-specific languages. And that's partly why Paolo at the time chose to use Groovy as the backend because he also liked Java. And Groovy is essentially built on top of Java. So it's a bit like a, it's a Russian doll situation, right? You've got Java, you've got Groovy, and then you've got Nextflow on top. Nextflow has its own syntax. It's got its own, it's got its own methodologies to write pipelines and to stream data through it. And so if you do want to get into the weeds and do more complex things, then you have the option of doing that. And that's one of the biggest benefits of Nextflow compared to other languages that might be using static formats like, like YAML and various other things, because with Nextflow, rather than having a standard flow, you can start doing more dynamic things in between tasks by leveraging the programming languages power underneath, underneath that. 
having it built on Groovy, having that custom DSL that was developed as part of NextFlow, so it gives you the flexibility in between those process steps to make a lot of decisions about how the pipeline runs. And so, also it's, you can import existing libraries, right? So any programming language has tons of existing functionality there that you can just import as a library, whether that's to load a, a YAML file or a JSON file, there are existing libraries in Java or in Groovy to start loading YAML files or JSON files. And, and so you can essentially piggy bank of all of that existing functionality, but use it within the context of a workflow management tool without having to rewrite it all from scratch, essentially. Yeah. And I would imagine with the advent of uh, generative AI and coding assistance that writing NextFlow pipelines is easier than it's ever been. I think there are still some people sitting on the wall a little bit there about how good it is, but I think that's generative AI in general. It's something that you need to review uh, and make sure that it's doing the right thing, but it's getting closer and closer in terms of generating these sorts of processes. It, de it depends on the context really in terms of what you ask it to do. There may be a need to curate the result and, and to actually inspect it to make sure it's getting it right. But I mean, like with everything else, it's changing the world. That makes a lot of sense. Beyond NextFlow, can you just introduce this to the other components of the Secura ecosystem? And uh, So NextFlow is essentially why Secura was founded. It, it's a language that allows you to write pipelines. It's open source. You run it typically via the command line. What we're doing at Secure and what we have been doing over, over the years now at Secure is trying to build a platform where NextFlow is essentially the engine. So the platform itself is a user interface. It's, it's now called Secure Platform. It was previously called NextFlow Tower. So we've just been through a massive rebrand effort. People are still slipping up, including me, but we'll get there one day. And so we built a platform that essentially uses NextFlow as the engine under the hood. And so the idea there is that the platform allows users to come in and essentially make themselves more efficient in terms of the way that they're running their next row pipelines, running their analysis, managing their users, also hooking in complex cloud infrastructure, which typically via the command line, when you have to do it next, it can be quite and has been quite painful. Whereas the platform itself has features built in that allow you to hook in cloud compute very easily. One of the biggest advantages also of the platform is that you run the Nextflow pipeline on your compute using your storage. And so the platform essentially is a pane of glass for you to run Nextflow in your environment. And so that way you keep your own data, you manage your own compute, and you also manage your own discounts with your cloud providers and that sort of things. We don't ingest your data. It, it stays with you. And that's been quite um, a very big, big common use case. And, and uh, some of our customers really love the fact that they can use their own compute when they're running next. There are also other cost-saving features that we've got in the platform to optimize pipeline executions, as well as doing various other things to, to really bring down costs in terms of how much things end up costing in the cloud, for example, uh, which can get out of control very quickly. It's a different problem to a HPC. With a HPC, you never see the light bill, but with cloud providers, it's more there, but you need to somehow control it. And so the platform helps with these sorts of things as well. And we've built a number of products on top of Nextflow or that sit alongside Nextflow, in fact, most of which are actually still also open source. LTQC, for example, is a tool to, as a bioinformatics reporting tool that's used commonly at the end of pipelines to aggregate QC results from various tools. That's also now a secure product that's all open source. We've got a containerization solution called Wave that really makes it a lot easier for you to start provisioning and building containers without you having to manually do this yourself. And it's got a number of other benefits that, that make it seamless to, to provision containers for your next pipelines, especially. And so that's also recently been open sourced. We have another solution called Fusion and Fusion is a very powerful solution for you to optimize the way that you're interacting with storage, especially in the cloud context. So in, in the cloud context, you typically are dealing with blob storage, right? It's, it's like remote storage that you have in the cloud, your, your files sit in a bucket somewhere, but you need to make them available to Nextflow in order to run the computation, whether that's a, a fast queue file or, or a reference file. And so typically what happens is you, you would copy that file into the virtual machine where Nextflow is running that task or where that task is running before you can perform the execution. And once you've performed the execution and you generate another output file, you would copy that out to another bucket. Now that can be quite wasteful because you're moving a lot of data around the cloud. 
And in fact, what you really want to be doing is trying to bring the data into the virtual machine seamlessly. And, and that's exactly what Fusion does. So it essentially mounts the bucket within the container for you to then perform the task execution without having to copy and stage it in and having API issues and failures because you're moving a lot of data around the cloud. And so Fusion really is has become a really nice solution to, to making these pipelines a lot more stable in terms of running in the cloud, especially when you're looking at, at larger data sets out there. So, so that's the product portfolio that we've got now. We've also got other more interactive analysis coming on. And so, so ne the platform also isn't just about running Nextflow pipelines. We're taking it to another level where the Nextflow pipeline portion is maybe the secondary analysis where you take fast few files and generate some counts. We've now got a feature called Data Studios that we've developed that allows you to take that output and then maybe interact with it in a Jupyter notebook environment and various other things. And so we really want to see the platform as the modern biotech stack. So you can take your data and start interacting with it and doing various other things and manage your organizational needs all within one user interface, but it doesn't end there. So you can also just click tons of buttons and be happy clicking on, on the user interface, but there is also an API as well as um, a command line interface specifically for the platform. If you're a biometrician that loves automation, you can hook into that if you like as well. That makes sense. So you're taking NextFlow, which is exclusively for running your pipelines in intelligent, parallelizable and reproducible ways. And you're trying to build an entire data platform around it where you've got the user interface component, which is about cost monitoring, cost optimization, I'm assuming performance optimization yep. as well. Yep, absolutely. Because I've heard that I've heard that one of the challenges with Nextflow is that yes, it's infinitely parallelizable, but that is both a benefit and and a drawback because you can have a situation where your code isn't running necessarily as performantly as it could, so it's having to be parallelized more than is optimal, or it's parallelizing so much that it's costing you much more than you would like from a business perspective. It all depends on how you essentially write your pipeline to some extent, also, right? There there was actually a really good talk by Hatem, who's at Google. In fact, he's I've not him for, for ages now and he's been he's been working with us on Nextflow support for google batch and various other things and he gave a really good talk actually at, at Nextflow summit a couple of years ago where he showed that if you take a fast queue file and you fragment it up too much in a cloud environment then costs start ballooning you can quite easily do that on a hpc environment because it makes sense and again you don't see the light bill with a hpc environment right whereas you do with the cloud and so there's always a sweet right. spot that you can optimize this sort of thing. Simple things like splitting a fast queue file, because the more splits you have, the more virtual machines you need to provision, the more virtual machines you need to provision, the more it's going to cost you. And so there are ways that you can start looking at optimizing the way that your pipeline is working in order to bring those costs down ultimately. And the platform itself has a number of features in built that allow you to see how long a task took and as again, costing and various other stuff as well to get an idea of, of what may or may not be efficient. Yeah. I'm interested in wave as well. So that's the containerization solution. What are some of the features that it's layering on top of something like Docker that add value for a workflow like so this? Wave has a number of, of features. Initially wave was actually developed for fusion. In fact, so Nextflow itself runs, uh, in the cloud, for example, um, it will run every task in its own Docker container, let's say. And that container contains all of the software that it needs to run that particular task, whether it's BWA or FastKill or whatever it is. They're all in that individual container. Now, when we develop Fusion itself is a binary. We don't want to rebuild all of the containers in the world ever, right? Because these containers have already been built. By containers has an amazing resource of hundreds of thousands of containers for every single Bioconda package there is. And in fact, we leverage that quite heavily in the NF Core community as well, to, so we don't have to maintain and manage these containers ourselves. And so the solution we found is that we implemented Wave to essentially use these existing containers and then just inject a layer, in this case, which would be the Fusion binary, into the container at runtime so that the binary becomes available to the container and you don't have to rebuild it from scratch. And so this became a solution now for, for Fusion. In fact, it was a byproduct of Fusion. But since then, it's gone on to have its own functionality uh, for various things like authenticating against private repositories. Uh, also, there's a ton of other stuff that we're working on now that are going to be game changers to some extent because Wave 
will also make it very easy for you to provision multi-tool containers as well. So right now, there's a lot of single tool containers that contain individual tools, but we're building out functionality, which we're probably going to announce in, in, in fact, it's, it's less than a month now at the Boston summit that allow you to start provisioning these containers on the fly for, for multiple tools with just a, a click of a button, picking what you want, go build me a container, no fuss. And so there's lots of other benefits there that, that wave can offer in terms of really making it easy to, to build and provision containers. So you don't have to manage all of that yourself. Prior to running the pipeline, you have to build all of the containers. All of the containers contain all of the dependencies for the analyses. Those containers are independently managed by different people who are responsible for making sure that the analysis embodied by that container runs the way that it's supposed to, that there are no dependency conflicts, that there's no bugs in the way that it builds. And so it sounds like Wave is like a layer on top of that allows you to incorporate into this diversity of containers, a set of tools that are necessary for the entire NextFlow ecosystem to run as it's supposed to end to end. And in particular with Fusion, you're managing the way that files get moved around since that can lead to both latency in terms of the amount of time it takes for data to move from one place to another, but also cost, especially when you're operating in the cloud, there are fees for moving files in and out of places. So having a, a solution like that allows you to take any container and optimize the way that data is managed within that container has both time and Absolutely. cost benefits. On, on, on the container provisioning side with Wave, there's benefits on the developer side, obviously there, because when you're writing a pipeline and you need a container, Wave will make it very easy for you to provision that container. Behind the scenes, we're just using the Condor APIs to query which packages you want and then to build that container on the fly and to host it somewhere for you. So you can just pull it um, with that with no fuss and then include that in your pipeline uh, when you're running it. And so that's a massive sort of cost saving exercise there. And also, as you said, with Fusion, you know that you're absolutely right. Ingress and egress, you can end up with huge charges on, on cloud providers if you don't carefully assess what you're doing and try and stick to, say, for example, a particular region where you want to process your data. Um, and Fusion absolutely will help with that because it means you have to move data around a lot less, but you'll also see a lot more stability in the way that your pipeline's running as well, because it's not erroring out whilst it's trying to download a file, for example. But yeah, there's, there's various other uh, benefits there and IO speed ups and various other things that we've optimized with Fusion as well. What are some of the most complex or amazing things you've seen done? inside of the secure ecosystem? I think some of these big features like Wave and Fusion coming to fruition, have it's been a process, right? It, it was something that Paolo dreamt up at some point that we need to have these solutions that really make it a lot more stable for you to run Nextflow pipelines, especially in the cloud. Most of our customers are on the cloud, 70% of them on AWS, let's say. There's this growing adoption on other cloud providers as well, like Azure GCP. And this is one of the great things about the platform. It's cloud agnostic. It's, it's in the similar vein as Nextflow. It can run on any platform. So you can hook in your compute no matter where you are and what you're doing and in which region you're running. So that you analyze the data, you analyze the, the data where it lives and, and you don't need to shuttle it around. So watching Fusion and Wave come to fruition has been really cool in terms of the engineering effort and, and how much time and benchmarking and optimization we've put into it to really see the benefits of that. We're also building out some really cool features on the platform as well that have been quite challenging. But I think at Secura, one, one of the, the key things is that we're encouraged to think outside the box and that mentality is nurtured in terms of pushing the boundaries, using the next technology. And, and that's somewhat evident in the way that NextFlow was developed and, and how it's changed the game, as I said, in life sciences. And we're continuing to try and push the boundaries there in terms of what, what the next best things are, are likely to be. But for me, yeah, I think Fusion, Wave, they were very hard problems to solve on the infrastructure side, especially in the cloud that, that are now reaping benefits on our side to some extent. And what about on the user side, on the on the companies that are leveraging NextFlow? Have you seen any sort of amazing pipelines or biological analyses that have come up that have blown your mind in terms of what NextFlow has enabled them to do? We have customers that are running NextFlow on thousands of samples at a time. Uh, this is one of the great things also about the cloud is that, yes, if you don't keep a note of costs and various other things, it can end up costing a lot. But also, if you do want to run 10,000 samples at the same time through an RNA-seq pipeline, you have the ability to do that. 
And there have been times where I've been on a customer call and they've just had a blowaway comment that, oh, we ran 10,000 pipelines through this, uh, 10,000 samples through this pipeline. I'm like, what? You did what? <laughs> but this is also, it's not cheap either. Let's be honest, because typically you want to perform a series of steps on the same sample in order to essentially push it through a, a pipeline, which costs money. But they have commitments and it makes sense that there are providers like 23andMe who are our customers who are running millions of tasks through NextFlow. And it's just seeing customers push the boundaries of, of what NextFlow can do that way is refreshing. And, and actually, it's a challenge for us to, to solve and, and make the product even better. Awesome. It seems like this paradigm of scientists engaging in like collaborative tool development and data sharing is it is a way of going about science that I think just makes a lot of sense and leads to more progress through that social engagement component. So I'm curious from your perspective, since you're at the top of this very large community doing this kind of work, how do you see the future of biotech, genomics, research evolving? So community is is incredibly important to, to Next. It has from the, the very beginning been important to NextFlow. It's also now incredibly important to Secura. And as I mentioned, we're, we're contributing a lot back to the open source. A big chunk of my team's time goes in improving NF4 pipelines and NextFlow pipelines. And a big chunk of my time also is, is thinking about how we can improve what is happening in the community to keep it moving forward and evolving. And that's not going to change. One, one thing that we have seen change quite markedly, in fact, since Nextflow has come around and, and even NF4 to some extent, is that biotechs and especially large farmers are now more open to contribute to open source. So before Nextflow was around, everyone, including ourselves, had in-house Python scripts or Bash scripts that were performing a task, but you couldn't share them with your collaborator across the pond, essentially, because they wouldn't work. They'd break instantly. All of the software dependencies and the tools and the, the hard-coded paths, they'd just break instantly. Whereas now, with the way that Nextflow is developed openly uh, on GitHub, uh, if, it, if, if these resources are publicly available, everyone can see what you're doing and how you're doing it. And so this is really encouraged and nurtured bioinformaticians and, and scientists around the world to really adopt these practices internally, also coinciding with the shift to, especially biotech and large pharma adopting cloud, all of a sudden, you've now got a, a cloud platform that you need to run pipelines on, but you don't have any pipelines to run. So you look for a workflow manager like Nextflow that can run anywhere, and then you look for content on NF Core, which should in theory run anywhere, right? And so now, rather than reinventing the wheel and writing their own pipelines, a lot of these, these organizations are now adopting NF Core pipelines, for example, and saying, okay, we just want to use this off the shelf. There's already a good community pipeline that's been validated to some extent that we can run on AWS. Why do we need to write our own? And so there's, there's a big shift in terms of mentality there. Doing things in open source has really changed the mindset in terms of how organizations that typically would do a lot of these things behind what firewalls are now actively wanting to contribute back to open source. And, and we have a number of professional services, consultancy type contracts, my team in particular, with some of these big organizations that we have an agreement with them to go back and contribute to open source. So indirectly, they're using these pipelines, but everyone is benefiting through our contributions back to open source. And so again, this is something that really is different compared to what maybe have, would have been done about 10 years ago. Yeah, it strikes me that this sort of coincides with a change in viewpoint on the part of these big pharma and biotech companies about what their competitive advantage is, that it used to be that they viewed the, the code for doing the analysis or the methods that they were applying to the data as being their competitive advantage, but now they're viewing the data itself as their competitive advantage. And so protecting the data is paramount, but the methods that they're applying to the data can be something that's more of a community-driven effort. They so, still the, might the mix have their proprietary pipeline plans that they keep private, but that makes sense commercially for them to do because it's their IP, right? But on the whole, for, for some of the more mundane analysis that you need to do, like an RNA-seq analysis, it's run of the mill now, RNA-seq in terms of analysis, quite well established. Single cell arguably is getting there too. And so for all these off-the-shelf pipelines, I think they see the benefit of using open source pipelines and, and even contributing back 
to them as well. So everyone benefits overall. Real quick before I let you go, is there anything coming down the pike for NextFlow or Sakira that you're excited to talk about here? <laughs> There's always lots. There's not a dull day in the job, really. There's lots planned. We've got a summit coming up in May, and uh, we'll be announcing a ton of new features there, I suspect, at the summit then. We've got another summit coming up in October in Barcelona, which is our flagship event. And again, we'll have lots of different features there that, that are coming out as well. We're trying to keep up with the game and, and constantly iterating and, and trying to listen to users and customers to improve the product and build good relationships. But yeah, Nextflow, on the roadmap for Nextflow, there might be a third version of the language, which is slightly scary, but also really exciting because it, it's going to solve a lot of the issues that have arisen over the years with Nextflow in terms of feedback from customers and that sort of stuff. So we've taken that stuff really seriously and and really going to try and iterate on the language to, to improve it for a number of reasons, like troubleshooting and, and various other things, cleaner syntax and static typing and various other things that would be nice to have. We've now, through Secure, got the ability to improve the open source layer of Nextflow, as well as all of our other open source products. And the platform itself, improving Nextflow will inherently improve the platform too. But we've got other features, as I mentioned, like Data Studios for interactive analysis, Data Explorer for, for exploring data. And then we've got another host of other features that will be coming out and, and obviously improving the, the current features on the platform to make it even easier for you to run Nextflow wherever you want and to collaborate on your analysis together. Well, Herschel, it's been a pleasure to have you on uh, the podcast. Really appreciate all the insight you've shared. Take care. Thank you, Ross. And that's it for this episode of Data in Biotech. If you enjoyed the episode, please subscribe, rate, or leave a review in your podcast platform of choice. See you next time.